There we go. Well, hi, everybody. Good to see you again. I'm still on the high from the baptism, so just, I'm just saying. I know I always begin by sharing with you that this is such an incredible place. It is my hope and desire that you know, that you know, that you know, that you know, that is true. And if you know that, let's see a show of hands. Okay, that's good. I, I like the waving too. Waving is good. The passage of scripture, the, the gospel reading for today is a pretty powerful one. And it's probably one that you've heard preached on, let's just say for a while. And there are pearls of wisdom in almost every single sentence. So a person wanting to share information could be up here for a very long time. Oh, that reminds me, I need to set my clock. Okay, there we go, start. And I don't doubt the scholarship of people who have preached prior to my arrival. It is all excellent. And every single line is something that you could live your life by, okay? And I know this is about friendship and it's about the transformation from one type of relationship into another. Basically, where the followers and disciples are now going to become no longer just followers or disciples, but friends of the master. It kind of changes the relationship dynamic a bit. And yet, that's exactly what Christ wanted. And if you think back, it was God's design. Okay? This was not a surprise. This was not the first time that God heard Jesus make some type of statement that said, oh, you know, you're, got, you're not going to surprise God very much. Well, I guess we could if we tried, but nah. Many scholars have compared this particular chapter of John with the description of Genesis and our creation story talking about the Garden of Eden, talking about how wonderful it was that God had chosen after creating all of the universe, choosing to create humanity and walk with him, talk with him in the garden, be friends with God. And God saw that uh, Adam was lonely, so this is as the creation story goes. Um, created Eve as a companion and a friend. And then let's just say some misunderstanding took place and they were um, evicted from the garden. Now, a lot of people spend all of their time on that, forgetting it's a creation story since none of us were there when all of that took place and that there are many religions and faith experiences all throughout the world who have very different creation stories based upon where they live and how they've grown up. So we can be respectful of that. However, what many scholars are saying about this particular chapter is in reference to the Garden of Eden story and our origins, that we have become through Christ's death, resurrection, and then walking among us, new creations. Now I've even heard them describe it as in the presence of Christ, the followers, the disciples were not just new creations, but co-creators. In fact, the apostle Paul describes us as believers as being co-creators with Christ. Do you feel like a co-creator with God? Any hands going up now? Ooh. Not even a miracle grow among you. Okay. Well, 
It's a lot of responsibility to place on people who have looked at their history and heritage in their relationship with God as being pretty negative, pretty punitive. And if you didn't do all of the things you were supposed to do, I mean, they started out with the, with the Big Ten, no football reference at all. <laughs> started out with the Big Ten, and then in Leviticus, it went up to like 650-something. There's debate about the last couple. And so, as that relationship with the Creator and the created changed over the Old Testament, I mean, you have to admit, it changed. And there are characters in that Old Testament that make us look pretty tame today. Um, but what remained until the presence of Christ was that there was a fear. In fact, there are a lot of people today who say, you must fear God, and you must do this, and you must do that, and there, you know, all the thou shalt's only with a must in it. And the presence of Christ means we no longer have to fear being in relationship with God. Is that resonating anywhere? The presence of Christ means that we no longer have to fear being in relationship with God. We have the love of God through Christ Jesus. We have forgiveness beyond even our wildest imagination. And if that's not enough, we have grace that's kind of like an umbrella that covers us and inspires us to be able to live life to the fullest, to give it our absolutely best effort, so that if you're going to make a mistake, make a big one, because grace and forgiveness <laughs> covers it. You think I'm joking, don't you? Ever since I was very small, I always had a relationship with God. In fact, the song we sang, Holy, 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 was one of the ones that we sang every morning at St. Paul's Episcopal School for children. And so we would all trundle into the sanctuary and we would all sing our song. And whenever I hear, there are two songs, there's another one, but whenever I hear this song, it's like I'm five years old again. And I have this sense of awe and wonder about the hugeness and the vastness of God and the world and the universe and my life and that everything is going to be okay. I may not understand how it's going to be okay or when it's going to be okay, but I know that there is some version of okay that is going to be in my life. And now in this gospel passage, we hear that we are going to be friends with Christ. Now, I know it's a, a week early for Ascension and really early for Pentecost, but Jesus did not leave us alone or even unattended. The power of the Holy Spirit is with us, and it, it says that after the resurrection and people gathered in the upper room again and Jesus appeared to them, he breathed on them. Now, some debate whether or not that was the original anointing of the Holy Spirit, but apparently it was not because Jesus said, um, don't leave this upper room until you have been anointed with tongues of fire and the Holy Spirit. Now, to them, that didn't make a whole lot of sense because uh, the story about the burning bush getting the attention of someone um, could be scary. And they had just come out of a very scary experience where they watched the one that they loved and followed and believed in, tortured, crucified, buried in a tomb, three days later, rise again, and then was among them. I mean, I, I remember being very small thinking, what would that be like? having grandma come back 
And I had this whole list of things that I would like for her to do. She made my favorite this or favorite that. She had the best hugs in the world. And, you know, as a child, I, I could recreate that in my mind. But no, most adults in that frame of mind, after everything that had happened in the life of Christ, they were, let's just say, a little bit hesitant. So here he says, we're going to change the dynamic of this relationship. Well, Jesus had been changing the dynamic of the relationship with the creator and the created since his birth, actually before his birth, but we'll just start at the birth. And so it meant so many things to so many different people. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Hmm. Well, in relation to the old creation story, we're still physically human, but we're something more. We're a new creation. And the phrase that I'd like for you to hold on to is less about being friends with Christ as Christ telling you something that upends a lot of major denominations, mindset, and control. These are lowercase c's. This is an uppercase c, okay? I teach elementary school, so you have to understand those things. And the whole idea that Jesus Christ could turn the role of religion on its head was for a reason. Somebody somewhere along the line got it wrong. And so Jesus was sent to correct right relationship, what it looks like, sounds like, feels like, and how you participate in it for the rest of us. Now, why is that such a big deal? The phrase that says, don't forget, remember, you didn't choose me, I chose you. That totally puts the concept of the creation story in Genesis on its ear. Absolutely. And there are a lot of scholars who debate about that to this point in time. However, there's a lot of debate about different words like predestination and all sorts of stuff. Just let that go. Sweep that away. And realize that regardless of what the world calls you, and trust me, the world calls us many different things. For the most part, things that we wouldn't repeat in church, things that we wouldn't say to our children or people that we care about. And yet, there is a name that most of us have a hard time believing. I am chosen. Can you say that with me? I am chosen. What does that feel like? Like that? Who was picked for basketball and baseball, and who was picked first when you were growing up in high school? <laughs> okay, just you and me? Yes, I was the consummate jock. So, being chosen means something very special. And there are religious groups and sects that take I'm being chosen, let's just say to degrees that exceed the bounds of chosenness, okay? Now, the challenge that we see even in the world today is that people who view themselves as a chosen race, and scripture says we're a chosen race, we're an anointed people, is that they think that means that they can control and justify whatever they think, feel, say, and do with, not impunity, but immunity. They have no consequence. However, for us, those who have been chosen, and it's, it's not about baptism as in with water. It is about baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's about what is in your heart. He, after all of the description of how their relationship has changed, Jesus says, 
It all boils down to one commandment. Love. Love your neighbor as yourself. It doesn't take a PhD in theology to look at the news for five minutes and see how well we are doing with loving our neighbor as ourself. As a matter of fact, it is an accurate description and we don't love ourselves very much. Think for a moment what it would be like if you looked at yourself in the mirror and you started each day and you looked at each task and challenge with the idea, God's chosen me, given me the gifts, the skills, the talent that I need to be successful to demonstrate what God's love looks like on earth. You don't need a jersey or a team jacket. Tattoos are fun, but they're not necessary. And I'm here to tell you that the Apostle Paul said the same thing in writing his letters to the churches. God has given you everything you need to be about your heavenly parents' work. Arthur Ashe tennis player from the, what, 70s, uh, had a phrase, oh, almost done, (laughs) had a phrase that says, do what you can with what you have, where you are at. Now, don't need a bachelor's, master's, PhD, to be able to receive that, but you do have to have the heart of a friend that when you see someone in need, you're motivated. You don't just think about it, you're motivated to act. Been in prayer all week, looking at the gospel, and there's a song by Michael W. Smith that um, was very much a part of my ministry years ago, and it was friends are friends forever. Because the Lord is the Lord of them. And friends will not say never, because the welcome never ends. Can you hold on to that kind of friendship, even if the only reason is because you need that kind of friendship? I know that there are denominations that want to control who you're friends with, who your family is, and all sorts of other things. But um, since God created us all, I am thinking that we all can be friendly. And there is a difference. We can at the very least be friendly, but genuine friendship is oneship with Christ. To be with Christ is to be in communion. And the kind of community that you have created here in Woodland Hills is that kind of church. Do you believe me? Let me see the hands. I heard a woo. Oh, that's good. (laughs) Well, I have successfully completed within my 15 minute time frame and I am just so blessed to be here. Please know that. I just, it's a wonderful way to end an absolutely outstanding week and to begin another one. So thank you for being here this morning.